Hello, Good Shepherd. I'm so glad you're with us today for worship. I'm excited about being able to share with you as we begin a new sermon series. But before we get there, I want to let you know that Disciple Bible Study is filling up. Uh, as of Thursday, we had about 22 that were interested, and I'm capping the class at 25. So if you're interested, uh, go ahead and sign up. You'll find all the information on our Connect page, umcgs.org slash connect. Um, there you'll find a button to go ahead and sign up or register for a disciple. And uh, if you'd like more information, I want to encourage you just to reach out to me personally. Just call the church or uh, reach out to me via email, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. We also are looking forward to another really important teaching time about the Bible for our third and fourth graders and their parents, grandparents, whoever it is that supports them in their journey of learning their faith. We're inviting you to our Bible retreat on September the 10th. It's going to be right after church. We'll share lunch together through three o'clock in the afternoon. So if you're interested in that, you'll want to register with Pastor Karen. You'll find the information again on our Connect page. And finally, I want to encourage you to support the relief efforts in Maui. If you're like me, the pictures that have come out of that terrible disaster really moved my heart. And I'd like to participate in that. We have an organization in the United Methodist Church called UMCOR stands for the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and they are always right on the ground, first in, last out uh, for these disasters around the world. And so if you want to support their efforts, you can make a donation online, again, through our Connect page, and just don't, uh, designate it UMCOR, and we'll make sure that it gets to the right place so that we can support the important relief efforts in Maui. Again, so glad you're with us in worship. Take a moment to check in. I want to know you're here on our Connect page. Um, and also, you can share your prayer requests there. And I'd love to know how we can be praying for you. As we enter our time of worship together, may the Lord be with us in this online space.
This morning, we begin a two-week sermon series on a tough topic, grief. And as we do that, I wanted to offer a centering prayer for us as we begin. So after I share the scripture, then you'll see on video a centering prayer that I've designed for this sermon series. And I thank Tim Bourne for putting it together in such a beautiful way. And I hope that it's meaningful for you. Today, we're going to begin with a passage from Matthew's gospel at the very beginning of the fifth chapter. This is how the Sermon on the Mount begins. And so hear these words of Jesus. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, he and his disciples came to him. And he began to speak. He taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I survey the days I have known, I see how in the place of my questions your grace has often met me, and in the mud sink of my sorrows I have found myself held and lifted. Across every barren and mire of my history I have never been abandoned or alone, though there were times, well, when, for a time, I felt it so. But even then, I can see that you had been there, present in those very mysteries. And in the end, it is in those wretched and desperate places that I have known myself most known by you, and understood myself most loved, most held, most tenderly nurtured and restored, most cradled in any weakness. In such moments, I have known that it was never answers I was seeking, so much as your presence and the peace that your presence provides. Now grant me the gift of a beggar's heart that knows its own true need. O God, a heart that harbors no hope of contentment, except it be held at last in yours. So, friends, we enter a very powerful scripture, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. It's known as the Beatitudes, and it begins, blessed, right? The second Beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This word blessed is hard to translate from the ancient Greek into English, But many commentators have tried to give a sense of what this means. And one of the phrases that really caught my attention is, you are on the right road if. The word blessed or blessed means you are on the right road if you are meek. If you are merciful. If you are pure in heart. You are on the right road if you mourn. Consider the power of that as Jesus offers these words in the Sermon on the Mount. These short sayings are what is known as the Beatitudes. And commentators will often note that the Beatitudes are not imperatives or commands, that we, are, we have to do these things. Rather, they're indicative or they're a descriptor, right, of, of the way things are. And we know this, right, that in life we all experience lack, We all experience grief or powerlessness or futility or pain. And so the Beatitudes really are a descriptor of the way things are in life. 
Jesus says that blessed are you or you are on the right path if you mourn. Hmm. I love the way that Brian Zahan in his book, uh, Beauty Will Save the World, he, he offers this quote about this particular beatitude and I want to share it with us today. I love the way he comes at this. He says, Jesus is not so much telling us to mourn as he is making an announcement to those who do mourn. Sorrow is a necessary consequence of loving others and being fully engaged with humanity. If our plan is to go through life minimizing pain and avoiding as much sorrow as possible, we will do so as shallow people. And Jesus has nothing to announce to us in the second beatitude. He simply leaves us in our prosaic self-improvement and self-contentment. It is through, Brian says, the work of grief that we carve depth into our souls and create space to be filled with comfort from another. Friends, we are human. And as humans, we grieve. Today, I want to offer you three short lessons that I think we can learn from grief in our life. And next Sunday, I'll offer you three more. But this is a part of what it means to be human. And so there are many lessons that we have to learn as we go through this experience of grief. The first lesson is this. Grief is simply the process of coming to terms with change in our life. We are creatures of habit. Some of us more than others. Right? But all of us, we have a need for routine. It allows us to, to know a little bit of what to expect. It provides some stability for us. And so when those parts of our life that we have become accustomed to change, we don't accept that change overnight. There's a process that we go through of learning to adjust to that change. Even changes that we've looked forward to. You know, when you move away from home for the very first time, some of our college students are moving away from home and they're excited about that. Or when you receive that new job or when you get married and these are exciting times, but they mean change for us. How we have known life must now be different. And many people are surprised to find that there is an attending grief, even when it's a change that we desire. So again, grief is simply the process by which we come to terms with change. And we all process change in our own way. But here's the truth, friends. We all go through a process. And so if I could offer you one freedom today, it would be this. Name that process. Call it grief. It helps to have a name when you're confounding yourself by those tears that come out of nowhere or those angry outbursts or that sense of being numb when you really want to be able to feel. And it really helps to be able to say, oh, right? That's grief. I, I recognize this and I can call it grief because grief, again, simply is the process of coming to terms with change in our life. And, and we all have a process that we go through as we do this. So we'll move now to lesson number two. That grief is a part of the human experience, right? It's, it's a part of what we all experience. We so easily forget that when we're going through grief because it feels foreign to us. We'll find ourselves saying, I don't even know what's going on with me or I feel so out of control. And, and those are difficult experiences for us because they, they feel odd or, or out of place, and, and as we go through those uh, experiences, what I want you to know, friends, is that you don't, we want to get past grief, but that also means that we would have to get past being human. You see, grief is an experience of being human, just like love is an experience of being fully human. So is peace. So is joy. So is delight. And grief is not the enemy, then. It's a part of how we experience being human. In fact, Jesus names grief as one of those experiences that allows us to be blessed. So lesson number two, grief is a part of the human experience. And then finally, lesson number three, we experience grief on its own terms. And to think that we are in control when we experience grief, we're fooling ourselves. Friends, 
Grief comes on its own terms and it goes on its own terms. Again, this experience of grief as being fully human means that it is just like for us love. It is like for us joy and delight and peace. And we're not in control of any of those experiences either. And so we have to acknowledge that grief comes on its own terms. Which means it goes on its own terms as well. That's right. Grief doesn't last forever. Unless, of course, we deny our grief, which in that case, it might last forever and it comes out sideways. And we wonder so many years after this change has occurred in our life, why can I not reconcile this? Well, because, friends, you have not gone through the process of grief. The only way grief lasts forever is if we don't experience it. But if we will allow it to come on its own terms, and then to know that it's a part of being fully human, then we do eventually adjust to this change in our lives. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying we get over grief. There are experiences in life that will bring about a sadness in us till the day we die. But what I am saying is that we get to a point as we process this change where we don't feel anymore like it will swallow us. And we begin to adjust to this change that has happened in our lives. And so lesson number three is that we experience grief on its own terms. We don't get to be in control of it. We don't get to determine how long it lasts. And we don't get to determine how it sometimes will resurface in ways that we don't expect. But we can name it. And we can experience it, and we can be fully human. And so, I want us to return to the Beatitudes and hear again Jesus' words. He says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Remember that one of the ways that we can translate blessed is that we are on the right road if we mourn. When we find the freedom to meet grief eye to eye and even have a conversation with it, what we will find is that grief has much to teach us about what it means to be fully human. And so today, I encourage us to embrace this beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord God, as we encounter such a difficult part of our life, what it means to be fully human, that which we call grief, we remember that you have grieved and are grieved even now. We know that our experience is not foreign to you, O oh God. And we know that you are the great healer and you hold out hope for us in our moments of grief. We pray that you would offer them to us now as your scriptures have been opened and proclaimed that you would do the healing work that's necessary in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.